We're in the gospel according to Luke. The gospel according to Luke. Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 39. Verse 39 and verse 40. Luke chapter 2, verse 39. The word of God says, When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, meaning that they had brought Jesus to the temple, he was dedicated there, he was circumcised. After they had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for what you've already done for us this year. We just think about how far this church has come. All the series that have been preached and taught and all the music that has been uh, performed and sung and how we have worshipped and how we have loved and how we have forgiven. And Father, we come to this last Sabbath closing out this amazing year and we just ask for you to take it to another level. Prepare us for the new year to come with this message as we focus on the wonder years of Jesus. These things we ask in your name, let everyone say, amen and amen. Now, children probably are not gonna ever get this reference, but you adults are probably familiar with the show, The Wonder Years. It, uh, it was a sitcom that came out in the 80s, and there's a reboot that is, that is out right now, and it focused on a time in American history that people believed were the glory days, the good old days, as they, as they would say. As uh, this show was narrated by an adult looking back and reflecting on his wonder years, um, how he went to school, the friends that he connected with, who he fell in love with, and all that kind of stuff. And many of you, again, probably were fans of that show. I, I wanted to reference that show because as we're going into the new year and as we're closing out this holiday season it's really interesting that we celebrate a lot again Jesus birth and as we did this morning also his death but we don't actually have a lot of information on the rest of his life I mean Jesus spent 33 years if we look at what historians have gathered he spent 33 years on this earth and we have a short record of it in his ministry, his three years of ministry, and barely a blip uh, when it revolves around his birth. But we have about 30 years we know nothing about. There's no record. Now, the Gospel of John tells us that if everything that Jesus had ever done had been recorded, the world would not have, a, have enough room for all of that material, all of those books. So today, I want to kind of just look into what I think the Bible does say about those wonder years of Jesus. Peel back a little bit of the layers of these texts. We're told in the text that we just read that Jesus grew and he became strong. He grew and he became strong and he was filled with wisdom and grace and, and the grace of God was on him. And so after that moment, Luke then goes immediately into the future. It's like a 10-year jump, right? This is after Jesus had fled uh, Herod. He had lived in Egypt for two years, and now they're back in Nazareth. And so he's a toddler, and he goes from Jesus' toddler years to the very next story in Luke chapter 2, verse 41. By this time, Jesus is 12 years old, the Bible tells us in verse 41. It says, every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover when he was 12 years old. Just curious, just curious, just curious. You ever wonder what Jesus was like as a five-year-old? Anybody ever wonder what Jesus was like as a six-year-old? You know, I asked the youth that in our Sabbath school class. I mean, you ever wonder what, what, what he was like as a 10-year-old? I mean, because some of our kids around eight, nine years old, they stopped being cute. <laughs> I remember when I stopped filming Nathan, I stopped taking pictures of him. I'm like, you know what? <laughs> This ain't, this ain't cute anymore. This ain't funny anymore. Boy, clean your room. I, I wonder if Jesus had moments like that where Mary and Joseph were like, boy. And I, I, I only say that because, again, the Bible is so silent on it. It's just, it's just like a, a quick jump to being 12 years old. Christ is now, you know, going through puberty. Jesus is looking in the mirror and seeing his first pimple. Like, this is kind of odd and strange. And the glimpse we have of Jesus in the story we're about to read 
I don't know if it reflects that kindly on him. Let, let's continue to read. Let's continue to read here. The Bible says he's there. He's 12 years old. And it says, after the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. So, one, I have a problem already with this story on two fronts. One, this is bad parenting. Right? I mean, your only assignment is to, like, protect the Son of God. It's like, it's the universe's greatest treasure, and it was entrusted to you, and you forgot about him? Yes. Not just, not just for a moment. The Bible says that they, they forgot about him, and it, three days is what it would take for them to finally find out where Jesus is. But then I got a problem with Jesus. Don't worry, Jesus and I are friends. I can say this about him. I mean, he's 12. But parents, you know how it is when your kids at 12 years old just kind of, you know, wander off. And you tell them, boy, why didn't you say something? Why didn't you tell me, daughter? Why didn't you tell me where you were going? Why didn't you communicate? And I'm just wondering why little boy Jesus, almost a teenager Jesus, didn't tell his mom and dad, hey, mom, dad, I'm going down to the, to the temple. I'm going to talk to some of the teachers, you know, just chop it up a little bit. And uh, no, no communication at all. Parents weren't communicating. Child wasn't communicating. Nobody knew where everyone is. And I think Jesus is unaware his parents had left him. This is why sometimes, parents, it's good for your kids to have cell phones. <laughs> see, I helped you out, children. I helped you out. You're going to go home and say, see, Mom, Dad, this is what you should have got us for Christmas. All right, so the Bible tells us that they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled for a day. They traveled on for a day. So they figured he's with his uncle. He's with his auntie. He's with his cousins, you know, because this back in the day, this is how families roll, even in our country. You remember back in the day, you could just, your kid just took off and you didn't know when, <laughs> where they were, and they just had to come back, you know, before sunset because you trusted the neighborhood, you trusted the family, right? And, and, and may I just add this real quick? Times have changed, family. You know that, right? Times have changed. I know we say it takes a village to raise a child. Yes, it sounds good. It's a great proverb, but you know people don't want villages in their business. Back in the day, you could discipline somebody's child in church, and the parents were like, get him again. Right? Child be punished at church, and then the parents be like, just wait till you get home. It's going to be worse. Right? That was the old days. Today, you can't, you can't put your hands on somebody else's child. Hello? You can't just talk to someone else's child and discipline them and tell them what they ought to do. So I just want to make sure that we know that as much as we are a close-knit family, listen, if it is not your child, if it is not your child, you must talk to the parent first. You must let the parent know, this is what I saw, this is what I observed. I just want to make sure you're aware of it because people parent differently. Amen? I know you miss the old days when people could just sit right next to you as a stranger and give you the look, and you were like, I don't know who she is, but she's looking like my mama right now. We can't do that in this church, so we have to be mindful that, yes, it sounds good that it takes a village to raise a child, but we know in this day and age we have certain boundaries. So if it's not your kid, if it's not your child, and those children do not know you, and they do not have a relationship with you, you can't just talk to them any kind of way. Okay? We good? All right, we good. So they're assuming Jesus is with the village, right? Somebody has him. Somebody has eyes on him. So after a day, they realized they cannot find him. And so when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple courts. Can I just say this? I, listen, some of us can lose, lose our way for just a moment, but it will take us days to get back. This is why we need to be careful when it comes to uh, consistency in our lives. Sometimes we think, oh, this is just a cheat day. This is just a moment. It's just a sliver of time. I'm just going to let my guard down for a second. Listen, seconds can turn into hours. Hours can turn into days. Be careful. Be careful. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen? Keep your eyes on Jesus. Follow Jesus. Watch where you are going. You may lose him for a moment, and it may take you a year to get back to where you were. 
It's quick, family. It's quick. So the Bible tells us that they find him. They find him in Jerusalem. They found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. So this is the first part I really want to focus on. Jesus was listening to the teachers of the law, and he was asking them questions. What does this say tell you about Jesus? He's inquisitive. What else does it tell you about Jesus? He's a good listener. What else does it tell you about Jesus? He's teachable. Most of us have believed that Jesus didn't need a teacher. He didn't need a rabbi because according to scripture, he didn't learn under any particular rabbi. Now it is very possible, very likely, according to what many scholars believe and even uh, uh, people in our church that we trust their gift of inspiration, that Jesus was kind of like homeschooled, right? Didn't want, the, didn't want to be uh, 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 tampered with by the world. Didn't want to be tainted by other teachings. But this verse says something just a little bit different. Jesus spoke to people that knew the law, watch this, better than him. He's only 12. At 12 years old, Jesus did not know what he knew at 30. And this is what, it's, it's hard for us to believe. It's hard for us to believe, but we just read the text where it says that Jesus grew in wisdom. He was filled in wisdom. We're going to read it again because uh, Luke actually closes out this story saying almost the exact same thing. Jesus was a learner. God, are you ready? God had to learn. You don't like the way that sits, huh? Because you like your God as a know-it-all. Perfect from birth. Perfect toddler. No, Jesus had to be corrected even as a little boy. You think he was like cooking breakfast potatoes and eggs for his parents at three? Say, Mom, Dad, I got you. He had to learn. He had to be corrected. You know why Jesus was such a great teacher? Here it comes. Why Jesus could be such a great rabbi? Because he was first a great student. You can't be a great leader if you don't know how to be a good follower. And we talked about that way back, way back when we were on our series on Peter, follower. You remember that series? If you don't know how to be a good follower, you cannot be a good leader. And Jesus had to learn how to be a good student before he could be a good teacher. So he asked questions. Now, I'm not saying that, that, that they knew everything and Christ knew nothing at all because the Bible tells us as we continue to read, right, he's asking them questions. And then it says in the very next verse, everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. So there was some give and take there, but understand that Jesus had to learn how to read. And if he wasn't in one of the, the schools of the rabbis, he most likely didn't learn to read in the more traditional way. I believe that every time he came to Jerusalem, he took advantage of, the, advantage of these moments where he could learn from other teachers. And little boy Jesus was a sponge. And as he learned and he processed and he grew in wisdom, the Bible tells us that even people who were uh, 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 with him at that age were amazed at such a young man having such a grasp of Scripture. Now again, I know this might taint your picture of God not being perfect, but even the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that Jesus had to learn obedience through suffering, right? Jesus was always a learner. He was always a learner. But the Bible then says this, that again, it's kind of an iffy moment here that, that, that makes me uh, just tense up a little bit. It says that after they were amazed, it says when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Question, was mama upset? Was mama upset? Of course she was. Why have you treated us this way? What she's basically saying to Jesus, are you ready for it? Jesus, you have mistreated us. You have mistreated us. Why have you treated us in this way? So she has the mother tone. She says, your father and I have been anxiously, anxiously searching for you. Who did she put the responsibility on? Squarely on Jesus. Now here's the question. Was she, was she right? 
was she at least a little bit right? <laughs> Don't worry, Jesus will still love you. He was 12. Give him a break. She had, she had some reason to be upset with Jesus. Now, instead of responding it, Mom, Dad, I'm sorry, I got caught up. Because you know how it is, kids. You know, you're playing Roblox, you lose track of time. Jesus, this is his version of Roblox. Right? He, he, he is in the temple. He is learning things in the temple that he could not learn by his father, Joseph. Now, Joseph most likely started off in a school with rabbis, but again, probably did not make the cut, and that's why he became uh, a carpenter. <laughs> this is why people became fishermen and shepherds, because they couldn't cut it in the classroom, right? Women weren't allowed to be in the classroom, so most women did not know how to read, and they could not teach their children uh, the Torah. So Jesus had to learn from some other sources. Now, there were things he did learn from his father and his mother, and there were some things he had to learn from the teachers of the law. So he could have simply said, Mom, Dad, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I lost track of time. I didn't realize it. We were, we were just going back and forth. Before you know it, three days have passed. That is not Jesus' response. Jesus gives you a response that no child can give to their parent right now, that no 12-year-old could give. He says to his mama, why were you searching for me? Ooh. Why were you searching? You're going to ask me a question? Why were you searching for me? And he doesn't even wait for an answer because it's a rhetorical question. You don't ask rhetorical questions of your parents at 12. Child, please. Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? And then you can imagine Joseph saying, your daddy's house? I'm your daddy. But Jesus pulls the divine card here, right? In this, in, this, in this move, he lets them know, I am your son, and I have a responsibility to you, but I also have a responsibility to my heavenly father. And if it has to come to that, that I am either obeying you or obeying my heavenly father, he's going to come first. Now, don't worry. Remember, Jesus has a dynamic relationship with his parents. There are times he, he does this later on in his ministry. Mom says, we ran out of Pepsi. He says, what's it to me? And she says, whatever he tells you to do, to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it, right? <laughs> Jesus says, Mom, no, it's not my time. She says, boy, please. And he does what his mama asked him to do, right, in that, in that particular story. So Jesus pulls a divine card. He tells his earthly father, my heavenly father's house. That's the business I'm about right now. Why were you searching for me? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. So they didn't even understand he had pulled a divine card. Honey, why did he say his father's house? Do you own this? No, honey, I don't own this. I don't get it. And this makes me question again, Joseph and Mary. Did you even know who you had? Did you even know what was entrusted to you in this moment? Some of us don't even realize what God has entrusted in us because we are all about our earthly business. That's why I'm telling you right now, you're going to get some phone calls in January. You're going to get some phone calls in January, and some of you are going to try to use the excuse of, oh, it's work. Oh, it's my family. Oh, I can't right now. I'm going through this. Listen, you got your earthly business, and you got your father's business. Hello? You got your earthly business that you're nine to five, you got to punch in. I get it, I get it. But you also have another responsibility as a follower of Jesus. Yes, you don't get paid the same salary, but let me tell you, what Jesus gives you is far more expensive, far better for you than whatever the world gives you. So Jesus is, I'm about my father's business, and Joseph and Mary don't even get it. So for them, it almost sounds like Jesus is straight up disrespectful. Joseph's like, boy, you wait till we get home. I'm not going to do anything right now with all these teachers here, but you just wait till we get home. Right? But verse 51, watch this, verse 51. Then he went down to Nazareth with them. What's the next word say? And was what? Obedient to them. 
Jesus understood how to be obedient to his heavenly father, but he also knew how to submit and be obedient to his earthly father. And many of us need to learn this skill. Listen, in this day and age of parenting, new parenting, I get it. Listen, I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm this way as a parent. I'll, I'll dialogue with Nathan. He'll say, why, why? And I'll try to explain everything. And when I was growing up, Nathan, I'm telling you, when I was growing up, your grandparents, please, there was no explanation. And everybody knows this was their answer, because I said so. They all know the answer, right? Because I said so. Oh, we're different parents. No, we're going to explain to our children, well, you see, honey, me and Nathan had the longest text conversation this morning. I'm getting ready for church. He's already down here with, uh, with, uh, with his Sabbath school class and Pathfinders. And we're just going back and forth texting one another because I need to explain to him. And I should have just said, sent one text because I said so. But no, I'm explaining myself. Long dissertation. Jesus knew how to submit. And let me tell you something, children... You need to learn this muscle. You need to develop this muscle because you're going to be in situations in your life where it's not going to make sense, it's not going to be fair, but your boss told you to do it, and you need to learn how to say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. You don't have to understand everything before you agree to do it. There's a number of things I didn't understand as a, as a, as a student growing up in school, but these were the rules. And learning how to submit to trusted people. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, again, submitting to strangers and people that you don't trust or you know, trusting your gut feeling around a certain adult. Listen, always listen to that. Talk to your parents about that. Uncle so-and-so made me feel a little weird or this teacher made me feel strange. I'm not talking about you just obeying without, without knowing anything at all. But I'm talking about trusted people, people who have fed you, have bathed you, people that, 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 have, that have gone to bat for you, people that have not harmed you. And so Jesus is being obedient to his parents. His parents have not harmed him. They have, they have protected him. They have been nurturers. And so Jesus is obedient going back to Nazareth. He is obedient. And this is what the Bible says in verse 52. And Jesus grew in what? In wisdom. He grew, grew in wisdom and what? Stature and in favor with God and in what? And man. Wow. He grew in wisdom. He increased in wisdom. Wisdom is not knowledge. Wisdom is not knowledge. Many of us grow in knowledge, but not in wisdom. Wisdom is the application of knowledge in a way that promotes growth. Wisdom is us applying what we've learned in church, doing something to bless others, to bless our community. Wisdom is not just sitting down and listening. Wisdom is acting out in the knowledge that we have for the better of mankind. Many of us are knowledgeable, but we're not wise because we don't apply what we've learned in the Word of God. And I can't be a part of another evangelistic series where we have a bunch of Adventists listening to the same stuff regurgitated over and over and over again, and we still don't act on it. We're, we're, the, we're the light of the world. We're the, Stop it. You haven't turned a light on in decades. Nobody knows who you are in your neighborhood, but they see me get in the car every single Sabbath, and it is a testimony. No, it's not. For all they know, you're going to Costco. <laughs> no, but pastor, we are dressed up. We have witnessed to them today. We increase in wisdom, and Jesus increased in wisdom, which meant whatever he learned, he applied it in his life. Whatever he learned at the temple, whatever he learned at the synagogue, whatever he learned under his father, whatever he learned under his mother, he was applying it. And that is why he grew in wisdom. He increased in stature. This is physical. I like this part. Most of us don't understand that Jesus had to grow in stature. In other words, he had to be healthy enough. The mortality rate for men in Jesus' day was in their mid-30s. Many men, they died from either disease or, or, or war, but they didn't have the same health benefits that we had. And under Roman occupation, it was a dangerous time for any Jewish man to be living. So life expectancy was not 50 and 60 and 70 years old. 
In order for Jesus to be where he was so he could do ministry and to be able to travel all night, do all the walking that he was doing, sometimes on no sleep at all, back to back to back, when he fed the 5,000 families, do you know that it was, it was, it was in, a, in a time where he was depressed, he was hurting because his cousin had been killed? And he was trying to get away to a lonely place, and he fed 5,000 families, which was probably about 15,000, 20,000 people. And then right after that, after all day of ministering to them, he goes up to the top of the mountain to pray to his father. Then he has to run down the mountain to go onto the sea because there's a storm, and his disciples are crying and screaming, and he's walking on water. And then he goes from that place to another event. I mean, it is quick. Boom, boom, boom. And you'll say, Jesus did it because God's spirit was in him. Jesus had to be physically fit enough for the Spirit to be able to use them in the way that it did. And let me tell you something. We're talking about knowledge and the application of knowledge so that it's wise. Many of us are not wise when it comes to our health. So we are not growing in stature. I mean, in some way we're growing, but it's not healthy. And for a denomination that has the health message, we have no excuses. Oh, but pastor, veggie meat is just as unhealthy. I'm not talking about veggie meat. Don't use that excuse. You know better. Everybody's talking about blue zones right now. And oh, Loma Linda's a blue zone. Glendale should be a blue zone because this church and this hospital is here. Yes, before we were Vallejo Drive, we were the sanitarium church. We were all about the health message. People should be asking us, how do you do it? Just tell me what your secrets are. We have to grow in stature. So I know you're making New Year's resolutions right now. Oh, we're not going to we're not going to eat this and we're not going to eat that. Listen, it has to be more than just a resolution. We want to increase in wisdom, which means we're applying our knowledge. We want to increase in stature, which means we're being healthy. And healthy is not just not just with our diet, it's with exercise. It's being emotionally healthy. Jesus grew in stature. He took serious the laws of nature, and that is why he was capable of bearing the load that he did. And he did this all through, his, all through his lifetime, so by the time he was 30, he was strong enough to take part in the ministry that he had to do. Can you believe that? This wasn't magic, it wasn't something mystical. Jesus was wise with how he applied the knowledge that he had. The Bible says he increased in favor with God. Now we know the favor of God is God's grace, and God's favor for the most part is unmerited. But I love this idea of growing in favor. Because I believe that as God blesses us with his unmerited favor, I believe that God will give us more when we're responsible with the favor he's already given us. So you want more blessing? You want more blessing? Jesus was able to increase in favor with God because he was obedient. He followed direction. And this is what we want. Family, I know you've already been blessed to this point. I know you can look back at your history and say, wow, I've done so much. I've done so, so much in my life. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Some of the greatest people in Scripture weren't doing great things until they were 80. Moses, hello? Hello? He was almost unteachable until he was 80. Then God was like, okay, now I can work with you. 80. What about Abraham? Father Abraham? He wasn't even a father like he was supposed to be until he was 100. Same with his wife Sarah. So just because you have already put in work does not mean your job is finished. If you are still here and you are still breathing, God has a purpose. One of our members, Sister Mackie, one of our members is turning 110 years old on New Year's Day. 110. Well, I showed you a picture of her the last time Pastor Iverson visit, visited with her, and, and, and we're going to do our best to see if we can bring her here next Sabbath. We're, we don't, we're not sure if we can do it. We're going to try so that you can lay eyes on someone who's 110 years old. And when we were there visiting with her, she was ministering to us. If you are still breathing, then you still have a, you have a work. You have a purpose. So he grew in favor with God. God continued to give him more favor because he was faithful with the favor God had already blessed him with. All right, our last point, increase in favor with humankind. To increase in favor with humankind. I love this. This idea that all we should care about is how God feels. All we should care about is if, if, if we're doing something for God. Doing something for God has always been doing something for others. 
Whatever you've done unto me, you've done unto then the least of these you've done unto me. Isn't that what he says? Matthew 25, whatever you've done to the least of these, you have, done, uh, you have done it to me. When we talk about our relationship with God, it is impossible to peel it away from our relationship with one another. So much so that Jesus says, if you even try to offer a sacrifice, a burnt offering, if you even try to pray to your father and you have an issue with your brother, settle your issue with your brother first, with your sister first, before you talk to me. Hello? It's that important, it is that important that we realize that our vertical relationship, our relationship with God that has favor, has a deep connection with our horizontal relationship, which also involves favor. Jesus wasn't just a good God, a good guy, a good person to his Father, he was also good to us, amen? This is why he increased in favor with humankind. And I will say this to you. I know what happened at Calvary, but know this. Jesus for three years worked in the open. For three years, he had thousands of people following him. For three years, Pilate knew who Jesus was, had Roman guards kind of watching him, even the Roman soldiers, some who became followers of Jesus, and they didn't mess with Christ. His reputation with Rome was so solid that when he went to the temple, knocking over tables, not even a Roman soldier stopped him. He was that good that even his enemies cared about him. Pilate, who historically speaking was an evil person, didn't even want to touch Jesus. I have found nothing wrong with this man. Nothing wrong with his message. Oh, but he says he's a king. But no, I know his kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom is no threat to Rome. I have no fault. I find no fault in this man. Family, a follower of Jesus will be seen as a nice person by all, even their enemies. If people don't like you, you're not being a good Christian. I'm not telling you to be likable by being what they are. No, 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 no. I'm telling you to be like Jesus. And if Jesus is lifted up, if Jesus is living in your heart, if you are like Jesus, you have his character, it draws everybody. And this is what God has called us to do. So for this new year, we increase in wisdom. We increase in stature. We increase in favor with God. And we increase in favor with humankind. This text will not be on the screen, but I want to read it to you anyways. Acts chapter 10, verse 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. Even though we don't have a record of it, this same spirit was with Jesus even in his wonder years. The same spirit. As a 14-year-old, Jesus was a blessing. As a 17-year-old, Jesus was a blessing. As a 22-year-old, Jesus was kind and the Spirit of God was with him. As a 24-year-old, the Spirit of God was with him. He was increasing in wisdom and he was applying everything that he had learned. People loved him and liked him before he ever performed a miracle and they were making their wedding list. They were like, hey, let's invite Jesus and his friends. He's such a cool person. And he had never walked on water yet. Last week, we talked about Jesus' superpowers, right? That he did most of his work as Clark Kent, not as Superman. He came here vulnerable, and we said it's so interesting. Why didn't he just save us with his strength? And we said not strength of muscle, but strength of what? Strength of character. This is how the great controversy would end. It'd be through strength of character. Jesus lived his life, 33 years living, six hours dying. Do the math. What do you think was most important? The 30 years of living meant that he would get to know you. His 33 years of living would mean that he could empathize. The 33 years of living meant that he would be a constant learner. The 33 years of living meant he was growing. Even in his ministry, Jesus was growing. He was growing. Even to the point of the cross, he was still growing and learning obedience. Father, not my will, but your will be done. And Jesus doesn't have to use the weapons of this world. He doesn't have to use his heat vision. He doesn't have to use his super strength because Jesus, his wonder years, you don't have to wonder about them anymore. They were years spent developing character, being more like his heavenly father, being kind, being compassionate. Second Corinthians says this, we close on this verse. Second Corinthians says this, for though we live in this world, Second Corinthians 10, verses three and five, though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. 
On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of who? God. And we take captive every thought to make it what? Obedient to Christ. Oh, that's a good word. How many of you going into the new year want this to be your mantra? You want to grow in wisdom, grow in stature, grow in favor with God and grow in favor with man. Is that what you want? If that's what you want, I'm asking you to stand to your feet as we pray. Oh, the, the enemy, he, he's scared now. We're not using his weapons anymore. We're not going to let our pettiness and our factions and our disagreements get in the way. We are fighting with new armor. We don't need to be the man of steel, the woman of steel. We don't, we, don't, we don't need to be invulnerable. We don't mind being vulnerable. We're going to learn to be like Jesus, the adolescent Jesus, the toddler Jesus, the Jesus in his 20s who probably thought he may have known it all, <laughs> the Jesus in his 30s that ministered to people, doing good, the Jesus who gave his life, and the Jesus who rose again, and that Jesus who is coming back again for you and I. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, thank you so much for this amazing, amazing testimony that we've read. Just a few verses that, that open our eyes to you as a God who's willing to make himself so vulnerable that he has to grow. <laughs> so vulnerable that he has to learn. So vulnerable that he must continue to develop. And so this is an example we have. Jesus, thank you for being a wonderful example to us. Like you, we want to grow in wisdom, grow in stature, grow in favor with God, and grow in favor with mankind. So every boy and girl here, every, every, every man, every, every woman, everyone under the sound of my voice, everyone listening online, Father, those who are making a decision right now that 2024 is going to be different. We're grateful for what you brought us through in 2023, but we know going into 2024, something special is about to happen. So Father, use us according to your will, that we may do good. In Jesus' name, amen.